that's how we're rolling with it. So, you know, if y'all just want to go around. Oh, boy. I have a non-existent. <laughs> I live in um, downtown Atlanta. Hey there, folks. So we'll be doing our normal little round robin, uh, talking to a few folks we have up here in person, uh, and then we'll jump right into it after that. So I'll do my best uh, to not ignore y'all throughout um, the class and try and uh, repeat any questions so you all know what's going on. But for the next couple minutes, um, going to be a little bit of dead air. So thanks for tuning in. See, we've got one person there. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome. Yeah, we'll be talking about the afternoon sun for sure, especially for this early stuff, because where it is now, sometimes uh, if it, we're trying to finish it in June, got to think about where it's going to be finishing in June so it doesn't struggle. I see a couple other but folks popping in, so we're just going around uh, with our little group up here real quick uh, before we dive into the class. So, um, excuse the dead air. We'll be back with you in just a couple. <laughs> Nice. And I found a spot, I gave my own trellis, and three different types, and the wind came up, and that was it. And my breathing was real good. 
Gotcha. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, between the winds, some of our random snows, the deer, especially on the west side of town over here, um, on, and, right, right. Right, yeah, you know, occasionally we'll get some hail in June or July that'll destroy the tomatoes and stuff, so it can be pretty unforgiving, but occasionally uh, it can be really good. We'll talk about the February gamble, I like to call it, you know. So, all right, so thanks folks, appreciate ya. We're gonna... Hey there, how are ya? Yeah, well, you might, you might not be. So I use the word demystified, but you know, I actually had a, a brief conversation with someone. Uh, really, debunking is probably a more appropriate term. Um, okay. The companion planting, it's all garbage, it's BS, so we're going to talk about the rules to follow instead of traditional companion planting. Um, so you may or may not like that. So, oh yeah, and we've got one that just joined, so. Yes, I'm Judy, I live here in Berkeley. Um, newly moved here from Minnesota so I don't know about the difference between the two drastically different climates. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Awesome, awesome. So we'll dive right into it. Um, so that's going to be kind of the second half of the focus. We're going to start out um, with the early spring garden, uh, some planning tips, uh, timeline uh, kind of concepts, the rules that we follow up here. We'll talk about protecting things, hardening things off, starting them inside, um, what we can do now. And that's the February gamble is there's there's a good chance that if weather continues like this through February and March, we can be starting stuff outside, uh, not uncovered, but with minimal protection right now, um, and getting a good head start, uh, and, and really have a great, uh, spring cool season garden. So it's going to be wildly different crops than we're thinking about for our summer garden. There's going to be no tomatoes, no eggplants, no peppers, but all of our greens, well, not all, most of our salad greens and hardier greens, uh, lots of our root crops, lots of what I call budding crops. That's the cabbages, broccolis, cauliflowers. I also included kohlrabi with that one, um, which some of y'all may be familiar with. It's a bit more of an obscure vegetable, but those crops all thrive in our cooler temperatures. They're cold hardy. Most of them can actually survive a real frost. Sometimes it'll do some damage, so you know, we need to keep an eye on that um, and maybe be giving them some protection. But lots of them will do just fine right now, either uncovered or with minimal protection. So, for example, we harvested radishes up here week before last that were, uh, I think they were September planted, uh, I think like third week of September. So slow growth for radishes, but then they sat under all that snow. They got a little bit of splitting from that extra moisture. Um, you know, however, they, they did just fine. And there was carrots planted along with them that have a nice early start, um, should be our first to mature, um, and our other kind of first uh, harvest. So that's what I call the February gamble. Um, I like to play around with seeding, uh, direct seeding, what we've experienced as the most cold hardy stuff uh, in the beginning of February, if it's looking clear. So year before last, I did that got germination and then the whole month of February we sat under snow. Most of it was just fine and survived, but then the stuff we seeded immediately after that snow a full month later, they ended up maturing at the same time. So there was no head start. So it really is a gamble. Seed is cheap, but your time and effort isn't. So 
um, you know, that's that's why we call it the gamble. So, in my experience, uh, most of our salad greens uh, and the roots are going to be your most cold hardy. The budding crops are going to be the ones that uh, are better candidates for starting indoors, transplanting out. Uh, some of our other salad greens are good for that as well. Um, you can definitely transplant them, but you don't need to. Um, the root crops are not good candidates uh, for transplanting out. They typically don't like that disturbance. If you're going to do it, um, biodegradable pots or, you know, upcycled toilet paper rolls is probably your best route so that you just pop it in. That's going to break down, you know, paper pots um, so that you're not disturbing those roots. And from, in my experience and from what we've seen up here, uh, arugula and some spinach and lettuce varieties um, are going to be the most cold tolerant. Um, just behind those are probably the mustards and collard greens. And then I put uh, kale chard, endives, topsoy, uh, a bit lower down. But a lot of those are pretty bulletproof, especially if you select for varieties uh, that are particularly cold tolerant. Um, another thing to always look for and we talked about this um, at our last class with the seed selection, um, is when we're looking at our calendar uh, moving further into the spring and early summer, we know that we get really hot days and we get those big temperature swings. So when you're shopping and looking at seeds slow to bolt, uh, bolting is the term for when those plants decide to go to flower instead of producing the root or the nice leafy greens um, or the bud, uh, you know, the broccoli or the cabbage that we want. They go to flower, we usually don't get our desired vegetable. Sometimes they're still edible and there, there may be some use, but it's not what we're after. So looking for slow to bolt varieties can be helpful. Um, looking for the stuff to plant during the February gamble, we definitely want the stuff that's, you know, most cold hardy, um, which a lot of those green varieties are. As far as the roots go, uh, I find carrots to be the most uh, cold hardy. Germination can take a while, and so that can be a little bit of a struggle uh, with carrots more than other varieties, uh, getting them started when it's still cold out. So we use that row cover stuff, um, which unfortunately is a plastic product. But we use the brand Agrabon. It comes in multiple different weights. We've gotten to the point where we pretty much always use the midweight. Although I do have some heavy weight, and uh, that's great for this time of year. And laying that down flat, uh, folded in half so we have two layers, is one of our main strategies for getting that, that germination. And that's all throughout the year. Right now, it's helping keep the soil warm. In the summertime, that's keeping it shaded um, and keeping it a little cooler, holding the moisture in. Um, but that's a, a product that really assists us with getting those started. And then you can see we have the hoops above on the beds. Um, sorry, you folks can't see on there, but uh, you know it's Agrabon or floating row cover or frost cloth. It has many names. Um, we use it flat as a germination aid, and then we bump it up onto the hoops, um, which I just did yesterday on the garlic. Those two beds have garlic in them, which is now you know it's like an inch and a half, two inches tall. Um, so we're getting the row cover up um, so that it's not pressing down on the leaf. Yeah. What about the grapes? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, what about cold frames? Uh, so cold frames are great. Um, the main concern is cooking plants. So you've got to make sure if you're going to do stuff in cold frames, you need to have ventilation and they make self ventilating valves. I think I don't know if there's other I, I know the term bayless valve for greenhouse and they're wax filled. So it's a wax filled piston. So the wax uh, expanding and contracting moves uh, the vent. And I know we have a local company. I can't remember if they're a real company or if they're small little builders, but they're doing some cool self venting cold frames. Um, I might be able to link that in uh, from Facebook, but yeah, cold frames are great. That's the only concern is that you're, uh, you can cook uh, plants really easily because we do get so warm on our winter days. You know, today, uh, the hoop house, if the doors were closed, it'd be warm and the fans would be on. Um, if we had a cold frame right now we would, and it wasn't venting, it would absolutely cook plants. Um, it'll warm up real quick. So they're great. Um, and that's uh, the flip side is they get better protection than this row cover. This row cover, depending on the weight, 
gives, you know, two or four or six-ish degrees uh, Fahrenheit of, you know, protection from the nighttime low. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you could walk it, uh, carrots in it. So the question was uh, in really tough soil, rocky soil, not being able to dig it up and loosen uh, for carrots. Can you do them in containers? Um, definitely. I'd say you just need a container that's probably 18 inches, two foot minimum depth. Um, I, I think you probably want, uh, you know, some decent depth. The other um, consideration is there's a um, whole group of carrot varieties uh, called French Parisian or Parisian market carrots and they grow kind of short and fat like beets so they actually are much more tolerant of tighter uh, shallower soils so I'm actually working on a breeding project getting a purple um, variety crossed so with some good success um, so beets radish turnip um, they're pretty frost tolerant and germination's a lot easier um, and faster, but not quite as bulletproof as the carrots in my experience. Um, I'd have a hard time ranking those. Um, radish and turnip are probably the easiest, uh, and arugula as far as the greens, probably the easiest and most forgiving to play around with uh, because they're small, mostly small seed, so seed's kind of cheap. Um, and they're super quick to germinate, and those are your quickest turnarounds. You know, a lot of radishes are like 30-day uh, turnaround, unless you get into like the specialty varieties, the watermelon, the black Spanish, they take longer, but our little French breakfast and Easter egg and uh, pink beauties, those are all like 30-day radishes. Um, some of the market turnips are 30, 45 day. Uh, arugula, it's like 28 uh, days for, you know, even 21 days, I think, for baby cut. Um, and most of those seeds germinate in a day or two. So they're the most forgiving and the most obvious when when it doesn't work. So you're not wasting time waiting for germination on carrots and then they don't germinate and you wasted two whole weeks to see if they were gonna germinate, right? They're less forgiving. Um, and we're gonna move right into talking about schedule. And um, it's important that when we're talking about starting seeds and counting days out and trying to, you know, reach deadlines, you know, these budding crops and some of these uh, roots and greens, depending where we have them, mid to late June is kind of our, our deadline. And it's gonna struggle, they're, they're often gonna struggle through the middle of our hot summer and then we're not ready to start planting them again until like August, September. And then we're gonna have to baby them in that August, September heat to get them going uh, for fall, right? Um, <clears throat> but it's important to remember with this counting germination time doesn't count your days to maturity are from when you have a seedling until you're ready to harvest so that you know carrots i use as the example because they're slow to germinate you know they're 10 to 14 day uh to germinate maybe seven at best um but that time doesn't count towards maturity so important to remember that as we're counting um and maybe carrots are more forgiving of going into summertime once they're established. They're less likely to bolt or, or I mean, they, they often get weird though, but that's more like what's going on in the soil, I'd say, than climate factors. Whereas, you know, weird temperature swings and climate factors will, you know, stop a radish from actually shaping into a radish and the same for beets and stuff. Um, and sometimes instead of bolting, they just don't make their their storage route, which is what we want from them, right? Um, so the budding crops um, are going to typically be the longest to maturity and the most difficult for us to pull off. Um, and it's because we don't have that mild, cool springtime, uh, you know, we don't have that 60 to 70 degree consistent for uh, just a bunch of time, which that's what they really want. So when we have those, uh, temperature swings in May and June where we're starting to get 70s, 80s plus, um, that's often what will stall them and make them not tighten into that cabbage head or make those broccoli or cauliflower florets really loose and start to flower. So 
there's two things that we can do to plan for that. We can make sure we're starting early enough that we're going to be finishing those crops by, you know, the end of May, early June. And I say I use mid to late June as our deadline, but earlier is better if we have time to do it. Uh, the other thing, using row cover when we get hot to protect it during the day. And most of these um, will tolerate some partial shade, most of the crops we're talking about. Um, and remember that, you know, even if they say full sun, it's often full sun in a place that has cloudy days. So we have no shortage of sun. Don't have to worry about that uh, with any of these crops. As long as they're getting, you know, good six hours um, or, you know, indirect six hours direct or if it's indirect throughout the day or you know it can sit under row cover like that 24 7 um, during those the, that warm time but all of those agravon that floating row cover weight has um a light transmission um percentage listed on it as well you know the heavy weight i think is maybe it's only 60 percent light transmission um, but the others are you know 75 85 percent so it lets a lot of light through um even still giving that protection um and so that'll keep a little bit of humidity in um and protect those a little bit when we're getting those temperature swings um and assist those to ripen up properly and so with the budding crops uh you know when you're selecting seed you'll see some broccolis and cauliflowers and stuff i don't think cabbages but those broccoli and cauliflowers some of those will be like 120 days uh, to maturity for us to pull that off and finish by mid to late June or mid June um, you know we need to be starting those we need to have those germinated by mid February it's like right right now we need to be seeding those now granted they are good candidates for transplant so we can keep them inside for you know four six eight weeks but we're going to need to pot them up so that was a big part of uh, the discussion last class was seed selection and seed starting was the space expansion you need to think about, you know, if you're going to do one of those little cell trays, six packs or, you know, it's some, sometimes those are 98 little seedlings in, you know, a small little rectangle. And if you're planning on transplanting that more than once, that's going to be a lot of relatively large pots. Most of us won't have space for it. So um, those budding crops um, are great candidates for that, though. Um, and they can go two weeks in one of the little cell trays, little plugs, maybe three weeks, and then you're gonna wanna pot them up. We usually go to like a four inch pot and can probably go two to four weeks uh, in there as well. Beyond that, you're gonna start running into them getting root bound and maybe starting to try and do funky things in the container, um, which may not be good for transplant. So we wanna stay on that um, kind of cycle, but you know, a 120 day crop, uh, mid February is going to be, um, when we're looking at trying to achieve germination, uh, 90 day crops going to be mid March and then 60 day crops are going to be mid April. You know, it's pretty much that simple to look at. Yep. Yeah. So a uh, 120 day crop are kind of planting or germination deadline, um, germination deadline, uh, would be mid February mid-March for a 90-day crop and then mid-April for a 60-day crop and then we'll see if you're shopping seeds you'll see that cabbages will be you know 85 days some of our Napa cabbages get down to like a 55 60 day um, now that is ideal we can expect slightly longer if we're planting these things and starting them out now because we're still short days so we've got to remember that these are ideal conditions. That's why some of these are so hard to pull off. So going for that tight window on that 120 day uh, broccoli might be too ambitious. Um, kohlrabi is probably the most forgiving um, and one of the quickest. Uh, kohlrabi and Napa cabbages um, are great candidates. You know, you can be uh, getting them out. Um, into the field, uh, you know, as late as mid April because those are, are falling in the 60 day and that's for, you know, that, that June harvest. The flip side of that is um, being that these are the more tender, more tender than our greens and our roots that we're talking about doing more direct seeding of, um, they're probably not ready to go outside mid-February without protection. So we need to be starting them inside. You know, mid-March is kind of the safe-ish 
time we use for that. You know, that's around here. They say that's when we should be planting peas. You know, uh, St. Patty's Day for planting peas. So that's often a safe time for um, hardy crops to be going out into the field unprotected. So our budding crops and like we're doing kale chard, uh, collards, things like that. Um, it's only safe uh, now outside with the most cold hardy. So those, uh, the arugula, spinach, lettuce, the root crops. Um, and then the one I, I didn't mention with the budding as well, that includes our uh, bok choys and pok choys um, as well, which are really good, uh, really good crops as well. There's another Asi Asian green called pot soy that's Chinese spinach. Um, another really, really cold hardy. And the mustard greens, I, I didn't mention enough, but they're great candidates as well. So uh, the other... Now there's two that I didn't mention. Um, they're what I call like full term cold hardy crops. So we put them out early now and they go all season. Anybody? No, no, not beets. No. Oh, I'm forgetting herbs though. I'll have to talk about herbs. Brief. Brussels sprouts, right? We plant, we plant them like, you know, mid March or April, but then we're not harvesting them until the end of the year. They're notoriously challenging around here because they get that it's not the woolly aphid, but it's a cabbage aphid of some sort. That's uh, it's just real tough in our areas, and it loves those brassicas in particular. Um, we'll talk about how to control that. Though. That's part of the um, diversified planting instead of companion planting. Um, and then parsnips are the other one. Parsnips are pretty much like carrots, um, but they grow like all season. I think they're like 120 or maybe even longer day crop, but they're cold hardy, so you can start them early and then be harvesting mid or late summer. Um, which I actually love parsnips. One consideration is the greens are toxic. So um, I don't know if they're concerned for livestock, but certainly if you're doing edible garden and encouraging children to graze, things like that, uh, you know, carrot greens are okay to eat, parsnip greens are not. Um, so um, just a little note with that. And then the other big thing. So you know, we talked about the low hoops and protection. Um, they benefit pretty much throughout the entire season, um, cold months and warm months. Um, if we're going to do any kind of like hard plastic or glass protection like the cold frames, we need to make sure it's ventilating during the day um, by itself or we need to be diligent about opening it when it's sunny, uh, which can be real challenging because um, it's amazing a small glass cold frame how quickly it heats up when it gets sun in the morning. It'll be 32 or sub zero, you know, not sub zero, but uh, sub freezing outside and it'll be 80 degrees in that box and no in minnesota when it was 30 below it was yeah yeah i mean it's it is incredible folks have <laughs> folks have made cool little solar heaters heaters just with you know plexiglass boxes and then you pump that air and it's you can get 140 degree air with just a little bit of sunlight and really cold yeah you're talking ventilation yeah just yeah yeah i mean just opening the top um, to let it vent, or you, ha you have some kind of automated vent on the side, whether it's thermostat or like, you know, the, the non-electrical, it's gonna be some kind of wax wax device. Just open it, but when you have to do it every day, um, you know, it's just, it, it can be a lot to take on. Um, just, I always remind people to be aware of that. You know, the daily care, it's same with the seedlings and the space. You know, it's just, it's not worth going too big because um, then you end up neglecting the entire um, instead of, you know, having a well-managed amount. Um, very guilty of that myself so but the other big thing with this is hardening the plants off we're starting these plants uh, indoors at room temperature you know never getting below 60 degrees we can't just put them out into harsh direct Sun wind and those cold nights without giving them an adjustment period and we call that hardening off um, ideally you're gonna harden your plants off for like a week 10 days uh, of gradually increasing increased exposure to the outdoors. This time of year, it's got to be a little bit of both. So you got to, you know, maybe you put them out at 10 a.m. or 11.30 when it's starting to warm up, but it's still a little cold shock, but they're getting a little heat shock. But the first time you do that, especially if you're like, uh, say you're doing salad greens and you're still in the little plugs, you're not in forage pots, 20 minutes that first day, you know, 30 minutes that first day, not hours. And then the next day, maybe an hour. But the smaller the soil mass is and the younger the plant is, 
that's not quite right, the younger the plant is, but um, when they're coming from inside, they're, they're really sensitive. So um, they, they harden up pretty quick. So, you know, you can get away with three to five days sometimes, depending how harsh it is, but um, the more you can harden off, and you know, by that last day, maybe you are leaving them out for five or six hours uh, from, you know, sun up time, giving them some of that early morning cold, and then, you know, into the midday heat um, before you transplant them out. Um, yeah, that full week would be ideal, but uh, a few days you can get away with sometimes. And then the last thing um, with the early spring plants, uh, we talked about briefly, and we've got some good example here with our shade structure, seeing how um, it's not providing shade underneath, it's providing shade on the north side right now, but knowing that come June, June 21st is the solstice, we know that, you know, sun's going to be as you know, straight and high up uh, as it gets, we're gonna have a lot more shade right under here. So planning that with your trees, your house, your landscape, um, knowing that these plants will struggle when we start warming up, especially with Western exposure, because right, our afternoon, that uh, afternoon baking sun is the worst. So Western shade is your best friend for a lot of these plants. And especially if that shade comes from deciduous trees that don't have leaves right now, it's ideal. That's the best thing you can do is uh, wisely use a deciduous tree um, so that it's going to provide western shade to that plant um, as we're warming up. Um, yeah, and so if you're building raised beds, cold frames, um, great stuff to think about, you know, using your house. Um, and again, we, we often don't have a shortage of sun. So sometimes uh, sometimes you don't even have a spot that's too shady on your property. A lot of, a lot of properties have space that, you know, there's nowhere that's too shady for tomatoes uh, in the summertime. You know, we have enough sun. Um, yes. Yeah, you can. Um, asparagus actually does real well. Um, it, it needs a decent amount of moisture, um, but there's actually, so, so the question was, can we do asparagus here? Um, there's naturalized asparagus in irrigation ditches in some of our agricultural areas. They even have a little patch up uh, under the pear tree over here. That's probably remnants of the old homestead. Um, I didn't mention it because it's a, I'm pretty much only talking about annuals, um, I guess. Um, and asparagus is a long-lived perennial, so it takes takes a few years to get it started, get it going. Um, and yeah, it's kind of like a wetland, creekside irrigation ditch plant. So you can think about that in terms of its water needs um, and tolerance of direct sun. It's another one that would be great for a spot with some little bit of Western shade. Um, and yeah, it's like two or three years of taking care of it before you can really start harvesting it. Yeah. Probably, probably never in plugs or containers because that small soil volume has the potential to like freeze solid. Whereas like if you planted it in, in the ground, that's less likely, right? It's going to be more protected in the ground. So probably never. You're probably going to harden off until a point and then maybe like transplant in an afternoon you know transplant in an afternoon or a morning and like and their first their first night of outdoor temperatures in the roots in the ground and like well watered um yeah you know follow some of those transplanting basics where you know you water it in you do it at the right time of day um but i don't think i'd be leaving them outside in containers um no, in general. Yeah. Yep, yeah, plastic, tarps, doing some of that kind of stuff. You know, that's one of the downsides of mulch, organic mulch, is right now it's keeping the soil cooler. You know. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. And it's one of those things with plastic or like tarp, something that wasn't breathable, you'd have to worry about cooking it. You would have to pay attention to that. Or, you know, uh, but yeah, you could have, you can absolutely do that. You know, they have uh, weed barriers that are black. Um, 
Yeah, Agrabon. Agrabon. Or yeah, floating road cover or frost cloth are kind of like the general. And the other thing, you know, we mentioned, I get it from an online supplier called Johnny's Select Seeds. Although it's pretty, pretty widely available. Although locally, I don't know that many of our big box stores or places sell it. Uh, at least not at a reasonable cost that I'm aware of. So the hydroponic spot or the feed store. Yeah, I don't know. I've never looked into it there though. We do always, uh, always order it. So, um, and then there's also the other option looking at something like that is they do make, you know, electrical. I told you about the, the seed tape. You know, they make electrical bed warming tape. You know, it's like a seedling heat mat for indoors that you'd use, but it actually goes in your bed, in the soil. Um, so, you can do stuff like that if you really want to get that head start and baby stuff. But um, sometimes we can get away without it. So, all right. Any other questions before we jump into companion planting stuff? Oh, the beets, so beets, um, you could be starting, you could include beets in the February gamble. You know, you could be trying beets out mid-February, late this month. Again, that's something I have the Agrabon or, you know, burlap or some kind of tarp kind of to protect germination. Um, and it's worth noting too that like those materials, you can let things get like, you know, they can struggle against uh, a cover a little bit before you have to bump it up uh, to the hoops. So I know uh, there's some growers that use kind of like wide weave burlap. They actually germinate through it and then carefully roll it off and remove it with the seedlings like growing up through it. Um, yeah, so, and I've actually heard burlap is 10 times better for the germination starting. I don't know if it's as good winter time for that, but for like summertime germination, supposed to be the best, much better than the Agrabon. So uh, I haven't gotten any to experiment with, but planning on doing that this season, specifically for carrots. Um, no, no, I, I wouldn't paint it. I wouldn't even worry about that, you know? Um, and really... Mm -hmm. Yeah, or like compost tarp like compost tarp material try the ideal because it breathes a little bit but it's still black um that's that's the material i'd look at so um so with companion planting has ed anybody or everybody seen a companion planting chart that's out on the internet <laughs> like if you google companion planting you will see so many different tables lots of them are really cute and pretty and it's columns and rows and dots of what matches or you know just each crop and it's like likes growing with this doesn't like this like this and they're so complicated and you can try and plan a really smart garden using one of those and it can be can be fun but it can also be a nightmare especially like when you try and put it into action uh and manage it uh and some of our expectations it just doesn't work and one of the ways that i think many of those tables have been compiled is somebody went through a whole bunch of data and picked out crop example cabbage and is like okay cabbage is susceptible to cabbage loopers aphids and these pests and then they look at another resource and they say okay this predator of said pest uses these plants as a food source and that's how that's put together and that's why there's so much overlap on it and there's very few specific side-by-side -side plant relationships that actually exist that there's any data to back um you know mexican marigolds repelling nematodes or you know what's the book uh, carrots love tomatoes mm you don't really and so they might do all right together you know and ca carrots are carrots are just great for under planting because of the shape of the root and and the way they work and we'll talk about that that's one of the things when you're planting things somewhat close together we can talk a little bit about um 
cool. I glad I hear that from a lot of folks, Julie. So we'll talk about kind of what I think is the ticket to replace companion planting. Somebody commented that she hadn't had any success or any luck with companion planting. So, um, so a lot of those tables have been compiled in that way. And so what's more valuable is to understand those predator prey relationships, understand how far those pest predators travel. And we just promote a diverse and pollinator friendly uh, garden because predator in the garden uh, and pollinator are synonymous like 90% of the time. Um, and it's not necessarily that like butterfly or bee is out there um, eating those pests, but at some form of their life cycle, maybe they are. Um, and lots of wasps and um, pollinators that we don't like think of as number one pollinators in some phase of their life cycle are great pest predators, right? Are great pest control for us in the garden. So that's what we're gonna focus on uh, with companion planting. Um, nitrogen fixation is another one that comes up. We hear about the three sisters uh, as kind of an annual guild often where you've got corn uh, which is a heavy feeder, squash, which is a heavy feeder, uh, but also covers the ground. So the squash suppresses weeds and then the beans climb up the corn because the corn provides the trellis and then beans are a nitrogen fixer. So they're feeding the soil. That's how it's always pitched is, oh, the beans feed the soil. It's not the case, especially if you're harvesting the beans. The way nitrogen fixation works is that there is a symbiotic relationship with bacteria in the soil and the nitrogen fixing plant where that plant is able to grow, which is growing using nitrogen, and it's able to do that mostly with nitrogen from the atmosphere and not the nitrogen in the soil. But it's not pumping fertilizer into the ground for the corn, and that nitrogen is going to end up in the beans. The only way you get it back in the soil is if you sacrifice that crop, usually before it flowers or sets its seed at least, and you return that to the soil, the nitrogen all locked up in the biomass of the plant so that's going to feed the next season so you might be able to pull it off in such a way where if you're composting heavily you're feeding the corn and the squash and hey at least the beans aren't taking a ton from the soil um, but it's not as idyllic as it's portrayed and the success is probably still reliant on good composting good gardening techniques um, so sometimes it's more valuable to just think about rotation and think about feeding your soil than to worry about interplanting nitrogen fixers in your annual garden. It's worth mentioning it often takes a significant portion of the season for that symbiotic relationship to get going. So annual nitrogen fixers, um, you know, they can be hit or miss. That's why usually you're gonna see that seed being sold with an inoculant and it, you know, uh, you're going to add that bacteria to the soil because it takes too long for the native ones to get going uh, to be useful for us. Um, so we're, we're not gonna worry too much about that. We'll consider a little bit uh, the space sharing of the root zone. So, you know, planting something like radishes, carrots, where, you know, they don't have widespread root systems where it's, you know, single uh, tap root. You can put those a little closer to plants that maybe have a spreading root system then you could two plants that have a broad spreading root system right but there's no secret to that it's it's pretty basic um you've got to kind of know how the plant grows um, but for the most part it's as simple as you know roots can go grow kind of close to some of those other ones and the little tiny salad greens you know arugula and lettuce and spinach those smaller plants are going to have smaller less spreading root systems than a big broccoli or a big cauliflower or something like that. So you can't pack those as tight. Um, one thing to consider is the salad bar effect with pests. Um, we know that monocultures are not as helpful um, and not as resilient as monocultures. So if we have 50 feet of lettuce in one row, maybe it's going to be more prone to a pest attack than if we have, you know, that broken into 10 foot sections of lettuce and then 10 foot section of another crop that doesn't share pests. 
but it can be hard to manage. So um, it's also worth noting that most of the, the predators and these insects, the, the little, little tiny ones that we often ignore, but we need to think about, 60 to 120 feet is kind of like their travel radius. So when we're planning habitat uh, for those um, for those insects and trying to, uh, you know, promote them throughout the garden. That's kind of how uh, we need to think about our distance. Um, so that's how we can break up the monocultures and have a, a diverse garden. I've gotten away from, however, I, I like doing stuff in blocks to some degree for management. And I found that, you know, these beds are 50 foot long and I find that it's much harder to manage long lines of different things so like a long 50 foot line of carrots with 50 feet of broccoli with 50 feet of lettuce is much more challenging to manage with irrigation, harvest, everything than it is to have a 12 and a half foot section, three foot wide of one crop and then a 12 and a half foot section of another. So that's something I've switched because I was very keen on companion planting in the diverse garden for a long time. So it's like, we're gonna fit, we're gonna tuck this next to this and all your rows. It was hard to manage. It's much easier doing those blocks. And because it's a 50 foot bed and I've got a bunch of pollinator support there and on the front of the hoop house and in that little corner, the insects are traveling around so I can still rely on that movement. It's still diverse enough that it's not a monoculture. Um, we could probably get away with 50 foot long next to 50 foot long because we have these other bunkers around. Um, so we want to break it up a little bit um, but just know that 60 to 120 feet is really as far as you need to be worried about breaking it up. And that's because of the travel of those small insects. Um, oh man, hold on. I have one more thing before I move on. Um, okay, so back to herbs. Um, I need to visit herbs briefly. And then the other, uh, the other thing with some of these charts and how they compiled that data that's uh, really, really important because, as I said, most of these beneficial insects that are providing pest control for us, they're providing that pest control in one phase of their life cycle, not necessarily all. And in the other phase of the, their life cycle, they're often pollinators. So they're eating pollen and nectar. That means they need flowers. And that's a big hole in a lot of these charts. The plants that were selected for those charts that says it's you know good, uh, it's good to have parsley and cilantro next to anything that aphids eat, because those plants support aphid predators. That's that's the logic behind that table being put together in such a way. Well, guess what? That only supports those aphid predators if it's in flower. Parsley and cilantro that is growing vegetatively, that's growing leaves which is what we want to be eating, that's not supporting those, those uh, predators, only when it goes to flower. It's really, really important. It's flowers, pollen, and nectar that are supporting these when there's not pests present, and that's when we need them the most. We need them to be, we want them around before the pest is there, so as soon as pest shows up, they're on top of it they reproduce and then they go back, you know, they're living around because there's pollen and nectar. And then usually they're laying eggs inside of the pest, you know, or something gross like that, or laying their eggs close to the pest, and then larva goes and eats. Um, and that's usually how it's working. We always want flowers, yes. And that's why so many of the things that we plant for pollinators support our perennials. And there's thing flowering right now. We go walk in the hoop house, there's snapdragon flowers, there's sweet alyssum flowering. Thyme has some flowers on it right now. Um, there are things flowering right now, but yeah, they were established and growing last fall. But that's also why the surrounding landscape's important. Some of the earliest pollen and nectar sources are often fruit trees, or not even fruit trees, just trees. Trees, you know, they, they're one of the first, uh, first, a lot of our weeds too, dandelions, a lot of those plants that we don't like. So we need to plan for that. And some of the favorites uh, of the small, and uh, I focus a lot on aphid predators because they're one of our biggest struggles. Um, we'll talk a little bit about mites and some others that are even harder to see 
uh, that the aphids also talk about sources for introducing uh, them into the garden so that we can try and boost and then nurture those populations. Um, but some of the favorites of those aphid predators and lots of the little tiny guys are uh, umbelliferae is the, the family, or uh, I think it's a different shoot, Apiaceae. Um, and it's the carrot family, which also includes cilantro and parsley and dill and fennel and all of that stuff. And there, alyssum's a cheater. It's technically a brassica, but it kind of follows the flower pattern. But umbe, umbel like umbrella, and they have that, I think it's called an umbral type flower, where it's an umbrella shape of many tiny little flowers. Those are often their favorites. Um, generally, insects are going to prefer white and yellow. Um, red, purple, showy colors are more for uh, bigger insects and animals. Um, that's more like, uh, you know, bat, hummingbird, um, attracting colors. So white and yellow are great. Although that, that doesn't matter much. Diversity is great. It's really good to get. But that's kind of a favorite of a lot of them. And really just smaller, smaller uh, clustered flowers are typically going to support more insects. And a lot of the smaller insects, um, whereas like big showy flowers, again, they're for bigger, bigger things, which may or may not have uh, as much value for us. So... Yeah, Gallardia is great. All of those, yeah, that's uh, Gallardia's Indian blanket flower. Um, you know, pin cushions, bachelor buttons are great and relatively early. Mm -hmm. Marigolds are great, um, although they're one of the ones that's rooted in a lot of mythology. That, you know, there's a specific mar And this one's actually, I think, actually has some uh, scientific documentation. There is a specific variety or maybe it is all Mexican marigolds, but that's a specific type of marigold. It does secrete like a nematodicidal um, chemical. So it can remove uh, root feeding nematodes from the soil. There's a mustard green that's also supposed to be good for that as a, a, a green manure, but it has to be tilled in. So you grow it to a short stage, till it in the soil and it wipes out um, a nematode test. But we've also got beneficial insects that can handle all of those as well. Um, and that's that's the route to go because if you often just in our normal care of the garden we can keep them alive and supported they're going to find the spaces that work for them um we just have to introduce them sometimes it, it really is that simple sometimes they're just not gonna rove beetles are a great example they control fungus gnats in soil um which if you ever have indoor house plants and you get little gnats buzzing around it's probably fungus gnats Usually not a major problem unless you get a huge infestation, then they can really damage uh, plant roots, uh, the larva feeding. Um, but road beetles are great and you introduce them in the soil, you can barely see them. They're, you know, a millimeter or two long. Uh, they won't leave plant pots inside because they, they just won't really leave the moisture and they can often control populations, you know, forever, especially if like you're recycling your soil, you know, you never let it totally dry out, let them die. They'll be around forever, but they may not ever wander into a raised bed. They're certainly never going to wander into our container plants on the patio, right? They've got a desert of concrete or asphalt to cross to get into those situations. So we may have to introduce them. Um, and beneficial insectary is the name of the producer and they are the actual insectary that sells to all of the distributors that exist so if you've heard of arbico organics or evergreen growers and all these other beneficial suppliers which we used to use turns out they all get them from beneficial insectary and consumers can order straight from beneficial insectary so there's no reason to go through the third party because shipping is huge and the quality of shipping the time of shipping to uh to receive a lot you know you're receiving vials of eggs or live insects um you know to release um it's really important to get them direct so uh, don't go to amazon don't shop random etsy suppliers uh for these kinds of things go straight to beneficial insectary um also i do not and we don't uh endorse or buy ladybugs the one that we don't go for it is because mostly they are not grown. I'm not aware of a single ladybug producer grower uh, in North America. 
they go into the Sierra foothills on the other side and they vacuum them up. Literally, they find them in these massive nests and clusters, which you may have seen in your garden at one point or another. Big nest of ladybugs just plant covered in and they'll vacuum them up and they ship them all around. And so it's not a good practice. And it also, there's, uh, it can lead to all kinds of different, um, what you call it, uh, uh, pests and parasites and diseases of the ladybugs themselves. So, um, yeah, that's the one that we don't do. I wish there was a, a producer because I'd love to actually manage ladybugs a bit more. Um, but yeah, we don't do that. So I really like the aphidious wasps. Um, they are parasitoid wasps of the aphids. So they lay eggs inside them. Their stingers are egg, uh, they're ovipositors for laying eggs rather than injecting venom. They turn the aphids into little mummies. They eat them from the out, the larva eats them from the outside and then the, a new adult emerges and continues the life cycle. And then again, there are these tiny little gnats that unless you look really close, you may mistake for a fungus gnat or some other tiny little black flyer. Um, and they love those tiny little flowers. So they're easy. I have a ton. I have three different species in my plant room at home. The population is, is stable and probably never going anywhere as long as I keep some flowers going. Um, lacewing, green lacewing larva. Um, I usually like ordering the larva, although you can order adults or eggs. Um, and you can read about the different um, parameters for releasing them and getting them going. They're kind of the good ladybug alternative. Um, the lar larvae are the real predators, just like with ladybugs. Um, they're like little alligators that cruise around and eat all kinds of soft-bodied insects. Um, also, just like ladybugs, the adults are kind of dumb and don't tend to like to stick around. The lacewings are the number one to end up in spider webs, you know? They, I, I don't know, I, I rarely see them succeed. Occasionally I see the eggs, so, you know, they get some eggs laid somewhere, but uh, they're kind of like ladybugs, they don't stay around. So one good strategy with these beneficials is uh, if you know you're gonna have a problem, uh, first off, it's important to ID your pest. So uh, these don't all eat all aphids. Some of them are spe species specific, so you gotta narrow down your aphid species a little bit, which is a daunting task. Um, it can be a real beast, but often the crop host um, and basic color can send you in the right direction. And most of them do generalize to some degree and they're bred to be, you know, they're bred for crop pests. So there's a good chance they're gonna match up, um, especially if it's aphids you're dealing with. Mites are a bit more specific and also uh, a bit harder to ID. Um, recommend anything for white fly is the question. Uh, let me think, I can't remember because I haven't dealt much with white fly. Um, Corey would know. Um, I know they have a couple, I just can't remember uh, what they are. So I would check out a, a Beneficial Insectaries website. And I think they, they have uh, they have their tabs uh, or most of the website organized by pest species. Um, or I think there's multiple layers of organization, but you can look for white fly controls um, and it will absolutely have them on there. I haven't worked with them. White fly, shore fly, we haven't had issues. It's mostly aphid. Um, caterpillars, uh, cabbage loopers primarily, um, and uh, fungus gnats that I deal with. And it's really aphids are the only one that seem to be the aphids and the caterpillars that ever do real damage or cause an issue. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, the question, the questions about uh, pests under the soil. Um, so for like the root crops and stuff, the only ones I really deal with, um, I get some cosmetic damage from roly polies. Um, I haven't had any insect pests in the soil aside from fungus gnat larva. And I'm not even sure I've seen actual suffering or damage from them yet. That's usually indoor seedling kind of thing. And if just having your soil too moist you know that's water management can take care of it by itself but you know typically um yeah i don't have any pests 
aside from aphids. You know, they'll go after radish and turnip. Granted, they're going after foliage. Um, I root aphids do exist, so there's a type of aphid that'll you know they feed on the root and like the crown of plants. Um, I don't see them too often. We typically get the leaf feeders. Um, <coughs> Say again. Fire Yeah, and do they do they cut the seedlings down? Are they like cutworm kind of? Okay. Yeah, I haven't dealt with them, so I don't know. That would be one. Um, typically, it's yeah, and typically there's not a general answer. It's going to be what is it. And then you can target that pest. And if it's a big commercial, you know, if it's a pest that does any kind of commercial damage, there's a good chance they're going to have a biological uh, of some sort for it. Um, you know, something like that. It may be, it could be, there's beneficial, you know, I mentioned root feeding nematodes. Um, there are beneficials as well for just beneficial nematodes that'll, uh, I think there's one that goes after fungus gnat larva. I think there's one that targets the soil cycle the soil phase of aphids some of these above ground feeding aphids also have um uh soil phases they often overwinter in the soil so yeah all of those things right yeah i mean and yeah you can't worry about that when we're growing in biologically active soil you you got to rely on rinsing it off you know and the chance that the, the things you the things you'd worry about with that really would be the you know foodborne pathogens that are probably going to come from fertilizer or a manure you know um the fecal coliforms and salmonella things like that but so rare in the home garden you know really really got to be pretty reckless with manure or some volatile biologicals um to get yourself in trouble there i think maybe i shouldn't say that maybe that's bad advice but um yeah, you know, you got you got to identify uh, what the pest is, and then, um, like I said, I like using them uh, beneficial insectary now for your order. Now, mites, um, you know, you have to get a hand lens or a microscope, and really, if you're going to ID your aphid, there's a good chance, uh, unless you get an easy answer due to color and host crop, um, you're probably going to need a hand lens or some kind of magnification to get a good identification. Um, and mites can be challenging as well. Um, the other side of identifying your pest is that sometimes if you have, you know, a big infestation, I know this is kind of tan a bit of a tangent from, but so that's it's the reason we do the companion planting in the first place is for garden health rate. So um, it's worth identifying the pest too because that can also give you um, either mechanical or uh, like pesticide, even organic pesticide options, you know, a soap spray or a sulfur spray or something like that. You know, if they, sometimes these beneficials are great preventative and can help. White flies on the grapes. Oh, gotcha on grapes. Uh, and Ashley talking about ID, double check that you have white fly and not leaf hoppers on your grapes. We have issues with leaf hoppers on our grapes and don't have a good biological solution at all um but i'd be surprised if it was white fly on grapes outdoors it could be though um but i bet that's um leaf hoppers um so certain things um like if you have an aphid infestation um biological may not be sufficient to take care of the problem they're good preventatives and you know good uh, post control measures to keep them under control but sometimes you do want to knock it back with a spray or something but you would not if you have a mite you're going to spray something different than if you have aphids you know aphids water blasts are relatively good because it's just a mechanical removal can do the trick but the soap sprays and things like that um insecticidal soaps can work really well on aphids and some of the soft-bodied insects but they don't work on mites mites you'd have to use you know uh, some kind of sulfur uh sulfur product a wettable sulfur or think regular horticultural oils might work but i think they're actually sulfur oils so and those are organic they're relatively safe you know they're not going to destroy your soil forever um you know 
the sulfurine, I don't think you want to breathe it, but it's relatively benign to be using. But you'd want to use that, you know, if you were planning a release, you want to do that a few days before your release. Because some of those will affect, can negatively affect your beneficial. So you want to plan that and schedule that. So we'll do it in such a way that, you know, if I know I'm going to get my beneficial delivery on a Tuesday or Wednesday, I'm probably going to, the week before, do a knockback with a soap spray or a sulfur. And then, you know, two days later, hit it again, try and get any leftovers, and then try and have a two or three day gap between releasing the beneficials to come in and do clean up and establish themselves. So, and then that's also the tricky thing is if you have a beneficial population, but it's kind of not doing the trick, it's really challenging. That's what I have going on at home. I've got a great beneficial population, but I have a, a couple plants where the aphids are still out of control and I don't want to hit them with the spray. And so I'm in this funny spot where I say, what do I do now? Um, so it can be challenging. Um, and then the last bit, I really, um, I can't advocate enough the uh, native bee hotels, native pollinator hotels. We had almost exclusively mason wasps, not mason bees, move into some of ours uh, up here, and they're caterpillar hunters. They look like yellow jackets, which is kind of scary. And again, identification of bugs, uh, of insects is so important. Because it's really hard to tell the difference unless you're looking with a really keen, uh, discerning eye. The difference between yellow jacket and beneficial, non-aggressive, caterpillar hunting mason wasps. Like a, like no, not at all. No, and that's these uh, native pollinator hotels are just like the little holes in wood or bamboo tubes, and they cover it with mud. They seal it with mud. So no, they don't make a paper nest. Um, they don't have a queen. They're solitary. Even though they will congregate in these houses, they are, they, they're not a hive insect, so they're non-aggressive. They can sting, but they don't. It's super, super rare. So they're just all benefits and none of the negatives we associate with yellow jackets and wasps and stuff. <clears throat> nope, nope, I was nervous at first. I thought it was yellow jackets building, but no. Um, unless there is a little, like, there's a little pocket in the top that is just like hollow space, you know. They they could, and I don't know if the fact that there's so many mason wasps moving in here, if maybe that deters them from setting up shop. Um, I don't know, but I haven't had that issue. I, I was worried that they were setting up shop, took the time to ID, and really I just saw their behavior and saw what was going on and was like, oh, you were something else. So... Uh, I did. Yeah, it's a seasonal seasonal deal, but you can find them online, or if you you know if you wanted to make one, almost any birdhouse design, just instead of doing wall on the front, you just pack it with the bamboo tubes, or take some wooden rounds and drill different sized holes in them. Yeah, yeah, we do have we have a massive example as well. So. So Ashley's asking, um, you know, more than, yeah, they do kind of suck it dry. They cause like the mottled yellowish, uh, you know, kind of dry spots when it's advanced enough, it will make the whole leaf kind of just like crispy and mottled. Um, salvia, yeah, they spread, they can spread on a lot of stuff. You know, we've had some issues with them with tomatoes in our greenhouse. And, uh, but really it's, they always are a yearly problem that makes the grapes look bad. Um, and if you go move your hand across them, they, they jump and fly everywhere. Um, yeah, I don't know about the Virginia creeper and salvia though. Seems like it'd be likely, um, those could be likely hosts for them. So, and you may want to send, um, send a message on here or shoot Corey an email. And I think his email is just c o r y at carsoncitygreenhouse dot org. But send Corey an email and ask him about uh, leaf hoppers on the grapes, and also if he's ever seen white fly. And he's dealt more with white fly being in the greenhouse uh, and stuff too. So, and I think that's about all I got, folks. So, um, any other questions?
think that's all I had. That's really what I wanted to focus on with the companion planting, was not anything about how to plant stuff together beyond, you know, focus on diversity. It's really all about the flowers. So I don't know if I mentioned, I guess the last thing to mention is, aside from, you know, those umbral, umbral types, uh, kind of being the favorite um, diversity, um, diversity is key, and diversity of, uh, of flowering time. So flowering throughout the year, you know, we never want the gap where nothing's flowering. Um, that's also how we manage these things as, as cover crops, you know, cutting back or deadheading keeps things going and flowering. Um, so that's kind of how you want to manage it. Just flowers all the time, lots of little tiny guys buzzing. Those little, little flies that mimic bees, they're called hoverflies or tachinid flies. They're great. They are a great sign. Um, lots of little flies that are not house flies are actually great. They have little aphid eating maggots and they lay them on the leaves and the maggots cruise around the leaf and eat the aphids. You know, it's uh, it's very, very difficult to see sometimes, but it's, you know, it's radical stuff. A lot of little buzzers are good. So. Yes. Oh, as far as releasing them? Yeah, that's that's maybe one of the biggest challenges. You'll see, so the question was, uh, what about a temperature range for these beneficials and do we put them out underneath? And right now it's basically, we don't put them out. It is too cold. And you'll see, um, you know, there's some cool, like kind of like uh, PSAs going around about like, you know, wait, hold off on your garden cleanup until the days are 50 degrees, right? That's for these beneficials because they, if we don't provide those habitats with the little tubes and stuff, they go to hollow steps. I have, oh, it's covered right now, but.
Harbor Hotel is like the gateway, gateway to Yosemite. So it's like not very well to be able to sit there. Can you give us a rodeo? I suppose that was now. Oh, yeah. Can you put that on the grass outside? And Raven? Was it Raven? There it goes. No, no, no. Okay. Of course, well. Oh, hey, I should probably end the live video, huh? <laughs>